Jesse, are you ready for rapid fire? I am ready for some eclipse fire. Let's do it. Let's do it. Here we go. So I asked Al Golden if Kingston Villamu Asa could find himself a larger role than just special teams this season. And I just realized that I had not queued it up net yet, but here is what Al Golden had to say about that. He's on track to. Um, he's a, an exceptional learner. He spends a lot of time at it. Like He really, really works hard at it. And um, he's got a pro's mentality, meaning like he comes for that, to that day, he comes ready to go on the material that is being covered that day. And uh, when it comes day after day, that's what helps him stay ahead of it. And uh, so he's ultra competitive. Um, he's got size, he's got lateral quickness. Um, he's, a, you know, uh, you know he, he, he can blitz inside, he can play the edge if we need him to do that. So um, he's doing a great job. I mean, he's really attacked this spring and we'll see where it goes from there. All right, so after hearing that, scale of 1 to 10, what's your confidence KVA is going to get legit linebacker reps this season? Um, There was nothing there that really was like, yes, he's going to be, a, you know, he's going to be in the mix. Really the thing I felt Al Golden He said he's on track to, though. He said he's yeah, on track to. That was the first of... thing that he said. And Al Golden is like, like, you know, like if you look at, you know, like the difference in the personalities of the two, they're both – Somewhat matter of fact, but obviously, you know, you heard Mike Denbrock earlier. You just heard Al Golden. Golden is a little bit more, you know, like downplay, pragmatic, you know, whereas as Denbrock, you know, kind of kind of adds a little spin to the things, I think, some of them. I see what you're saying. I just feel like the when it, he kind of just the he kept highlighting on his versatility. And I think what that what I took is that is I don't think he'll be in a starter role. But I think he'll find himself in some packages that allow him to maybe not play, you know, traditional Mike linebacker. Maybe he's in because he he if you play the clip back again, he kept highlighting he can come off the edge, he can blitz, he can do this, he's good at that. Like I just think that that shows if they need him for a specific instance on this package of you know uh, this down or situation, I think he's going to find himself in those sort of roles, and so. While I, I while I I don't think he's going to get a ton of reps at like a true Mike linebacker, but I think he's going to be kind of plugged in here and there because of his versatility to do things across the board. If that makes okay. sense. You so you I'm putting at an eight out of ten. Talk to all that. You go eight out of ten. You made it sound like you were going to give it a four at nope. the best. The nope. way you talked your way around. I mean, like, you literally I just don't it. think he's going to get starting reps. I don't think he's going to get Mike I'm linebacker not saying reps. starting reps. Oh, here, here was the question. The question that I posed and the question that I, that I said, will he find himself in a larger role than just special teams? Not a starting role. Just a larger role than special teams. I'm going to go ahead and play the clip again because you said if you play the clip, blah, 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 blah. <laughs> he's on track to um he's a, an exceptional learner he spends a lot of time at it like he really really works hard at it and um he's got a pro's mentality meaning like he comes for that to that day he comes ready to go on the material that is being covered that day and uh when it comes day after day that's what helps him stay ahead of it and uh so he's ultra competitive um he's got size he's got lateral quickness um He's, a, you know, you know, he, he, he can blitz inside. He can play the edge if we need him to do that. So um, he's doing a great job. I mean, he's really attacked this spring, and we'll see where it goes from there. Okay, so I'm going eight as well. <laughs> I mean, you talked for like five minutes before you finally gave your eight there in the end. But, you know, again, like pros mentality, size, lateral, ultra competitive. First thing that he said is that, you know, basically he's trending in the direction that he is going to have a larger role than just special teams. And when you look at, like, the body that this guy has as a true freshman and his, you know, some of the physical things that we've already seen him done in, you know, limited practice windows and stuff like that. I mean, he's, I think, you know, again, I do think he's going to be on virtually every special teams, you know, for Notre Dame this season. Drake Bowen is going to be the starting Mike linebacker, but I think KVA is going to be the number two. And to what you were talking about, he is going to find himself in some of those 
you know, down in distance and situational packages and stuff like that. You know, whether it's blitz inside, come off the edge. I think that they can do a lot of different things with KVA. So I came away like, you know, again, I expected sort of the standard. Well, you know, he's an early enrollee and it's spring and we're only, you know, I think it's eight practices in or something like that. So I haven't really seen enough to kind of make that kind of decision yet. But he was, you know, for like, for as rosy as Al Golden is going to get, I thought he was pretty rosy in what he was saying about Kingston there. Didn't you? Yeah, I, I did. And I think I misunderstood the question a little bit. I okay. think he's definitely going to have a role outside of, you know, a special teamer. Um, but in terms, I guess I was more so looking at it like, is he going to take time away from Drake Bowen? I just don't think he's going to do that. No, and I, but saying. the thing is, is too, is I, everything he highlighted, like, you know, the way he's processing, how he attacks practice and, and absorbs material. Like, I, that's just every linebacker, especially when you're playing at Notre Dame. Like, these are all guys who are doing these things at a high level. So I guess there was nothing that really was, like, that stood out as a differentiator until he started talking about what I was defining as versatility of we can put him inside, we can put him outside. And, again, the last – the way the very last thing he said was if needed, right? And so, like, it feels like – if we need to put him around in different packages because we feel like we are deficient here or there, or maybe on a third and long, we'd like to have a guy off the edge that brings yeah. a little bit more athleticism. Well, That's kind of what I was getting at. But he's that. also trending right now toward potentially being the number two middle linebacker right, right. off the bat behind a, you know, like another really good middle linebacker. So like that, that alone, I think says that it's looking up for KBA. I think Tommy says <laughs> celebrity death match between the Styers, the younger and Derek Calmer. Let's get it on. You ready well, for that? There's only the, the, the first of all, there's only one celebrity in that sentence. <laughs> so we have to amend the title, but I mean, we're in the same city. I'm ready at any time, any place we can. Uh, How close can to Cleveland this. is Derek? Like, is he in Cleveland? He's on the outsides. I think he's like a 20, 20. He's in the suburbs of Cleveland. Okay. My understanding is like 20 to 25 minutes. I'm surprised you still – you haven't gotten together on that yet. He keeps inviting me, but then we'll uh, – Yeah, I know. <laughs> but then it, it'll be like a second before whatever and then get mad that I don't show up. You've but. got your things to, to do, right? <laughs> very, very important, very important <laughs> stuff going on over there in Cleveland. Fill in the blank. Notre Dame quarterback commit Deuce Knight has been invited to the Elite 11 finals after topping the leaderboard at his Elite 11 regional this weekend. I missed where the blank was supposed to be inserted. I'm sorry. I don't know. It's blank. <laughs> <laughs> it's electric. I mean, Deuce Knight. This is what happens when you send me these things like five minutes before the show starts. No, so. no it's it's electric that Deuce Knight um, is, is continuing – to be like the best of the best. Like it, he is like, I love the elite 11 stuff because it drops to me, like all the labels, right? Like it's just quarterbacks are here. It's it, let's grind. Let's figure this thing out. And so that to continue to see deuce Knight um, Excel is, is like, it's good and bad. It's like a double-edged sword in my opinion, because the, with the more that he does, I think he's going to get more interest out of more people. Right. And like, I know that he's all on Notre Dame and, Da, 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 da. But until he is, you know, not his name is inked to the paper, you're always going to feel some type of way. And so while it's like really cool to see him, you know, kill these quarterback camps and, and be one of the best of the best. It also is kind of like that pit in your stomach of, all right, let's not get like too popular here or too good here because we got a good thing going on. It's like, yeah. let's let's stay. Let's stay with Notre Dame. Right. Like only Notre Dame needs to know about you, not the entire you know, all those all those teams down south type situations. Well, so. your buddy Lane Kiffin is all over him. I mean, Lane, you know, they 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 want him down there. I've they heard about it. There. He keeps showing up to oh. his basketball games and stuff. Right. Or, or he was. Right. Tommy, I have not seen the 40 time yet. I saw him run the 40, but I haven't seen the 40 time published anywhere yet. I was looking for it in the time that I had after Jesse sent this to me um, a little while ago. But yeah, yeah I, I mean, can find it. You think he can? Yeah, let me look around a little All bit. All right. Uh, he, he was j just some of the video that I saw, of, you know, whether it was the 40 or, you know, some of the drills they had him do. He he looked pretty good, and he had a man's body 
You know, like <laughs> he's a he's a he's a long, lean guy, but just you know, looking at him with the t-shirt and you know the physique that he's already got as a guy who's going into his senior season, he was pretty impressive looking. And, and this was the the yeah. Oxford Mississippi um, regional, right? right? right. Um, I mean, just to kind of go off of this this article here from twenty four seven Sports, like. They labeled him as the alpha dog. Knight's arm strength was evident as he displayed the velocity to pierce the winds at every level, despite Mother Nature's best efforts. Pierce the winds at every level. And despite Mother Nature's efforts to refute, meaning it must have been a windy day out there. Um, in addition to flashing some high arm talent throughout the day, the four stars' natural ability to operate on the move as a passer is a particular attribute that should translate seamlessly into Mike Denbrock's offense. What he feels like is like to me, he's he's like uh, he's the Jaden Daniels to to Mike Denbrock, in my opinion, right? right. Like he's the profile of Jaden Daniels, Good Caleb job. Williams, all you know what I mean? All those kind of guys that are Heisman level quarterback, in my opinion. And so I just the more I, the reason why I sent that to you is just. You know, the more and more you see that he's doing well, it's just the more and more you get excited because I think he's going to be ultimately the best quarterback that Notre Dame has seen come through from start to finish in a really long time. I think so, too. And I mean, he's still you know, like to your point about the worries that he's going to go someplace else and just get more interest. I mean, he's already got a lot of interest. You still see him out there all the time tweeting about Notre Dame, tweeting at other guys and and stuff like that. So. Obviously, it's always a concern until they sign on the dotted line, but I don't think I'm any more concerned with him than anybody else. DJ, coming in. Hot. Hit the like button. Do it. Do it now. We appreciate it. Thank you, DJ. So, fill in the blank. Notre Dame women's basketball player KK Bransford entering the transfer portal is blank. It's unfortunate, right? But at the end of the day... There's always going to be a transfer. And the reason why there's always going to be a transfer is because you're playing at the University of Notre Dame. These players are the top players in the country. KK Bransford was a McDonald's All-American when she came into Notre Dame, right? Mm -hmm. And so when you're one of the top players in the country, you know, you're a McDonald's All-American and you're coming into Notre Dame and you're playing, you know you have the talent to be the girl, right? Like to be the, the, the lead of a team. And then when you see, you know, Hannah Hidalgo, uh, Olivia Miles, Sonia Citron, you start to kind of see your role or, you know, your spotlight dwindle down a little bit. And it's natural to want to be the head of the show, right? With so much talent, KK Bransford probably feels like I could go to another school and be the person who is leading this team, right? Like I can be, the alpha of this team. And again, it sucks, but I mean, I've already seen that two UConn girls have hit the, the transfer portal. Like this happens to programs like Notre Dame, to UConn, South Carolina. When you're the top end programs, these really good players get restless. They want to play more and they want to have more of a yeah. spotlight. She only started 19 times over the last two years. And as you said, this was the two-time Ohio Gatorade player of the year, Anna McDonald's high school, All-American. You have higher expectations. And when you factor in everybody who's already coming back, who you touched on, you've got Hannah Hidalgo back. You've got Sonia Citron back. Good chance you get Maddie Westfeld back. And then, of course, you're getting Olivia Miles back from injury next year. That's four right there. you know. And one of them is a forward. The other three are guards. And then you've got Kate Koval coming in. You've still got Nat Marshall. And I, I wouldn't be shocked if they bring in at least two more transfers. They're probably going to go, you know, you got Emma Rich coming back. I didn't even think about that. You know, she's, she's much more of a shooter. shooter. And that's what hurts KK's game is she cannot stretch the floor. Her whole game is mid range and in slash to the basket, pretty good defensive player, but she's only, you know, she hit six, three pointers this season after hitting one all of last year. So in two years, She's hit seven three-pointers, and that's just – that's not what the game is. For a guard, you know, you've got to at least be a threat from the perimeter, and you, and you would see, you know, players play – off, you know, defenders play off her quite a bit, especially toward the end of the season. And you would also see her, unfortunately, sometimes kind of take probably some ill-timed shots because it gets to a point where 
You're always yeah. coming off the bench. And now it's like, well, you know, I got to get my shot. I want to get my shot up. Yeah, that's exactly right. You know, so it's kind of like now or never. Like if I don't get my shot up, I'm not going to get my shots up. You know what I mean? It's just I have a very limited window. You feel the pressure of, okay, I know this is my window. Let's maybe get not bad shots, but maybe shots that you wouldn't normally take. You know what I mean? Like, yes, like 80 to 90 percent of your shot. And to, you know, Decaf's point was, you know, he said he was, you know, it seems like a, you know, kind of a shocking move. And he says he'd rather come off the bench and have a chance at a national championship than go start at another school. Well, unfortunately, as Jesse talked about with with where we are with the transfer portal, that's not what most people want. Most people want to go out and they want to be they want to have their Caitlin Clark moment. To yeah. Be honest with you. Yeah. And, you know, let's because it is also a transfer portal era, you know. Transfer portal and NIL era, even though I think, you know, she's, you know, has good NIL opportunities here at Notre Dame. If you go to another big school someplace and you're in the starting lineup, potentially gives you even, you know, more and bigger NIL opportunities. So all those things are intertwined. I mean, you know, very good player, but I just, you know, when, when this was announced, it was, if, if I was going to. You know, my when, when I kind of sat there and was thinking about it over the last week, you know, who's coming back? Would anyone want to go? Everyone else, you know, most people are talking about other players in terms of who might enter the transfer portal. This is the probably the least surprising to me because of all these things that we talked about. You know, she was still the like the first player off the bench, but not in the starting lineup on a regular basis. They want to be out there starting and having a chance to get theirs. I almost view the transfer portal now as just like trades. Like Notre Dame is giving KK Bransford the the or the giving the transfer portal KK Bransford, and it's going to spit something out in return. Yeah. Right? It's like almost like you're just the transfer portal is like legal trading without contracts. Almost it feels like to me. Right. Well, you know, and it, I didn't even mention. I don't think Cass Prosper potential. You know, like if she's fully healthy next year, so you're already getting Miles Prosper and Rish back. So that's three people right there that you're competing with time for miles is going to be, you know, like she, like the, you know, they, everyone talked about the big three this year. If you like West, you get West belt back, it's going to be the big four plus, you know, adding, adding Koval next year. It's going to be a pretty dangerous. I mean, there's lineup. a reason why they're number three in the way too early rankings already. Right. Right. And I've seen, I've seen some people, I, I, I can't remember where I saw this comment today, but somebody was asking about, you know, does Neil Ivy, you know, have enough players on scholarship? Well, you know, why doesn't she have more? You know, let's remember, she had a very, like, when you look at all the players who were wearing sweatsuits at the end of the bench this year, there were, you know, like a lot more than than they had planned on. They started the season with Emma Rish and Kassan Prosper in the lineup as part of the regular rotation, not to mention Kylie Watson, obviously, a fixture as a starter. So, like, she actually had you know, a couple more players than she typically has this year compared to her first couple of years. It's just that they had the unfortunate run of, of all those injuries. You know, I keep saying it, but if they're healthy, they're going to be really good next year. Really good. Like ESPN's already got them in their way too early top three. I think they had them number three. (laughs) So more players on the bench than coaches. That's right. TD for ND. Like there were. All right, so South Carolina beat Caitlin Clark in Iowa in the Women's National Championship game. Here is South Carolina head coach Dawn Staley after the game. I really would just like to say that um, I I have to congratulate Iowa on an incredible season. Awesome, awesome. And I want to personally thank Caitlin Clark for lifting up our sport. Hush. She carried a she carried a heavy load for our sport. And it just is not going to stop here on the collegiate tour, but when she is the number 1 pick in the WNBA draft, she's going to she's going to lift that league up as well. So so Caitlin Clark, if you're out there, you are one of the goats of our games. We appreciate you. 
Okay, so there, again, Don Staley, the South Carolina head coach after winning the championship. I don't know about you, Jess, but I'm just about worn out, tired of all this goat talk. And, like, everyone has to talk about goats and all that kind of stuff. Can I, I, can we just can we just put it to rest? Like, do we have to keep talking about that? Well, yeah, it's just frustrating because I don't understand why we can't just say Caitlin Clark is one of the greatest players to ever play and, and call it good at that. Like, I really liked – how Dawn Staley mentioned her. She said she's one of the goats in our game and she always will be. I don't think you have to say that she is the greatest or, you know, I don't understand why it's always a competition or let's line up the track record of, you know, who is ult the ultimate goal. Like this is a great player who influenced the game in a tremendous way. And I thought Dawn Staley said that great. And I think that that's the way everyone else needs to look at it. It's just, she's a great player. She helped the game out a ton. And I hope that it continues beyond her. I hope that, she is able to, you know, motivate or inspire a generation of young girls who want to play basketball and continue to bring, you know, the spotlight to the sport. And so I just think it's rather than, hey, let's like, is she the GOAT? Let's just be thankful for what she has contributed to the women's game. She's one of the greatest players of all times. And all these, you know, like Brianna Stewart was was saying she's got to win a championship to be considered the GOAT. I mean, look, Brianna Stewart, like, those girls played on the best teams ever. Right. Like, and, they, and that's, that's, they like, were, there were four Clay, Caitlin Clarks on one team. And that's what I was going to say. Like, to hear these UConn players take shots at Caitlin Clark is just ridiculous because, because of what you said. Like, UConn and, you know, like go back to the Pat Summit, Tennessee years. It's like every player was a Diana Taurasi or a Sue Bird or a Brianna Stewart or a Maya Moore. Or, uh, you know, Candace Parker, on and on and on. You know, they, they, the, the, the talent was just, you know, the, the rosters were loaded with this five-star talent. And essentially, you know, like Vince was talking last week about, well, those Iowa players, they're, you know, they're really good. They're, they're nice role players. You know, like Stolke, I think, has the, you know, the biggest upside of any of them. They're good players. They know their system. They know their roles on that team. But Caitlin Clark completely elevated that team. With no Caitlin Clark, I was not in the national championship. Oh, not game one bit. Two years in a row. They're not even close to it. They're they, you know, they might not even they might be, you know, like a first or second round NCAA tournament team, but they're not what they were without Caitlin Clark. So it's just completely different. It's an apples to oranges argument when these UConn players start, you know, setting the standard with winning championships because that's all they're used to. I mean, they've got more championships than anybody. Those teams could go out and and probably win gold medals for the U.S. in the Olympics. Right. Like, to be honest with you, those UConn women teams that, you know, had star after – like, they could have went and, and won gold medals. Like, it's just not – it's just not a fair comparison. And, and you brought up another good point. It's just like – I, these UConn players consistently bashing on someone like Caitlin Clark was just not a good scene, in my opinion. Well, it's just you know the fact that you've already got Rebecca Lobo sitting, you know, in that chair on you know on the main ABC broadcast for the Final Four, and I think she does a good enough job. But everybody knows she's Rebecca Lobo, you know, from from the UConn Huskies. So you've already got someone from UConn sitting in the big chair on the TV broadcast. Then you have the bird to Rossi. It's just too much UConn. They're, you know, like right. Th th you need somebody else from another school. There are plenty of Tennessee players, whether it's, you know, like Andrea Carter does a great job in the studio, and I wouldn't want to see her leave the studio, but, like, that's someone who could easily, you know, be in one of those seats. Like, if you're going to do the bird to Rossi show, I think there needs to be a player – from another program that's that's in there with them to just not let you know to to kind of some checks and balances you know to keep them you know sort of to, to to check them a little bit just like you've got you know Barkley Kenny the Jet Smith and and, and Shaq. Shaq on inside the NBA you need somebody from a different program to kind of yeah I mean and you got different the, the you know, that's a point guard a power forward and a center right so yeah. it's just like different teams different positions different perspectives but i just ultimately don't understand like what what gives them not the right but like those yukon players bashing her and saying that she needs to accomplish this or that or this or that like it just felt it didn't feel right and you know i get it like 
every rookie or freshman, quote unquote, is always going to catch a hard time from the vets. Like that's no matter if you're going into high school, college or professionals, like no one likes the rookie. No one likes the, the freshman. You know what I mean? Like they're the grunt. They get picked on whatever. But like I don't understand the hate for someone who has the potential to bring excitement to the WNBA like they did college basketball. Like you should want a player like this in your league because of the potential right. exposure that she can bring to you. Because you know what that means? More fans, more t- sales and tickets, more TV, uh, more eyeballs on the TV. And that just means more money in the bigger contracts for those women players that already feel that they're at a disadvantage when compared to the WNBA or sorry, the NBA. And so again, why would you not be rooting for someone like Caitlin Clark to join your league when ultimately she can generate more revenue? That's just my opinion on the situation. Cause it's and, ultimately more jealousy, you know, like right, Diana and that's, Taurasi got to be one of the biggest stars in the game. And it's like, she's been playing professionally for 20 years now. Like, you know, you're going to retire at some point. Can't you just be grateful that, Someone is going to, as you just said, bring more attention to your sport rather than crap all over them because you're jealous of them, basically, of the attention that they're getting, you know? Like, you got to win your championships. Yeah, and no one did that to them along the way either, you know what I mean? Like, no one was, like, sitting there questioning them about their talent or their project, how they'll project into professionals or that they need to accomplish this or that to validate how good of a player they are. It just simply wasn't like that. Absolutely. So the women's championship game just uh, came out this afternoon, right before the show started, 18.7 million viewers. So each of Caitlin Clark's last three games, Elite Eight, Final Four, National Championship, set a new viewership record, 18.7. Coming into this year, you know, coming into the Elite Eight a week ago, I think, what was it, like 10.7 was the record from last year's championship mm-hmm. game so the the viewership nearly doubled from last year's championship game to this do you buy or sell tonight's men's game getting to that number 18.7 million yeah so women peaked at 18.7 million and, and it said that they had 24 million uh or sorry average 18.7 and peaked at 24 million at one point i don't know if the men are going to beat that because the thing about caitlin clark is she is getting casual fans to watch the game right and i don't think the men have anything to to do that like they're not just getting people to to click over because like everyone knows the Clay, caitlin clark name and so whether or not you're a basketball fan a women's basketball fan like you could be a casual you know uh i would say maybe female and, and you want to feel empowered or, or kind of feel this movement so you're just going to tune in because you've heard about this caitlin clark i don't think the men have anyone in that they, they have good you know the, the returning national championship at UConn. You mean guess, Zach Eady doesn't push the needle like <laughs> yeah. Caitlin Clark? Yeah, the 7'4 giant doesn't quite push the, <laughs> the needle for me. And so I honestly don't think they're going to because I think unless you're like a fan of, of men's college basketball or of these two programs, you're not just getting the stray viewer. That's ultimately what I was trying to say is like Caitlin Clark got a bunch of stray viewers because she's Caitlin Clark. I don't think the men's game has something like that right now. I agree. I don't think the men's, uh, I, I think, I think maybe they come close, you know, like in the 17, 18 million ballpark, it is going to be on TBS compared to broadcast. You know, the women's game was on ABC, you know, and that's a big part of this contract as well. The fact that, that they're all, you know, the men's is alternating back and forth every year between uh, TBS and CBS. The, the, the Kansas Carolina championship game a couple of years ago got up a nice number, but those are two of the bluest blood programs that you could have. Like that's a dream matchup for any TV network to have Kansas against North Carolina in the national championship game. That's not UConn Purdue. It just doesn't move the needle the same way. So calf gets it. No interest in the men's game tonight. I'll be watching the Cubs is what decaf said. And it's, I'm going to be honest. It's going to be tough because we're going to talk about these tip off. times. <laughs> now look, the women's game is tipped off at three in the afternoon, two years in a row. There was some grumbling about that. The men's game tonight is going to tip off tonight at 920. And there's obviously grumbling about that as well. Like, what do you think about these types? I'm I glad no you problem with the women's game tipping off. I'm glad you've game. combined this into one question. I love the women's tip yesterday. It was I, I had I had enough to get up. I had enough to go walk around. We got to downtown. 
we went to the science center, had a couple of drinks, uh, went to a bar and caught the end of the game in downtown Cleveland. Like it was great, right? Like it felt like I could get everything else I wanted done in my day and the national championship fit into that schedule. Yeah. And I could just continue to keep going. Right. And the, the late game sucks. I don't want to stay up that late for it. And if you had to pick between the two, I would take the women's start over the men's start. And again, that's why I'm glad Absolutely. you combined the question. I would much rather have the women's start than the men's start. There is, I just, I don't know if, if, if it being in Arizona has something to do with it because it's not a 620 tip until local time. They always but, tip off the men's championship at 920. It's ridiculous. It doesn't matter where they play it. It's ridiculous. And they, like it's that popular of an event. I, I, I like it is, at the, but it's not, it's not, it's not at the same time. <laughs> right. And I mean, the fact that the women's game in the middle of the afternoon pulled that kind of number just shows you that people will watch if you put it on a time where everyone can watch. And people always talk about, oh, the kids, the kids. The kids were able to watch Caitlin Clark. They're going to be in bed tonight when, you know, this game tips off. Most of them are going to be in bed or heading. And they're returning back to school after spring break. This that's right. This eclipse day. Or, like, or, you know, driving Everyone's back crashing and burning. You know, after, yeah, that's right. <laughs> That's I, I've got because like basically like the women's pe the, the the women's fans complaining about the three o'clock tip off. They're saying, oh, we're not good enough for prime time. That kind of thing. Well, they just proved you don't need to put it in prime time yeah. on a Sunday afternoon when everybody's off work. I mean, that's that's why so many weeknight games get pushed to prime time because people are at work. The NFL plays at one o'clock and four thirty every Sunday and people watch that like it's always you know it's the most viewed you know, TV programming year in and year out like they've got no problem with it I've got no problem with it I thought it was perfect and you're also not going like Sunday night prime time is also one of the bigger you know there's not as much probably on right now but it, it is still from a TV standpoint that's still where you put some of your best programming is Sunday night. And so you don't have to worry about going up against any of that either if you put it at three o'clock in the afternoon. And the fact that a record 18.7 million people, you know, 24 million with an average of 18.7 just proves the point. 920 is ridiculous. Like I didn't think that I was going to be able to make it. You know, remember last week when uh I guess it was it was Friday night. I didn't think I was going to be able to to stay up for Iowa UConn for the women's final four, you know, in the second semifinal. I'm not nearly as interested in Purdue and UConn as I was in Iowa UConn on the women's side Friday, though. Especially at halftime, if it's not close, you're going to get a lot of people who click away. Yeah. Salty asking what happened to Kansas. Now, are we talking about when they played in the championship game that I just referenced, you know, the championship game that they won two years ago against North Carolina? Or are we talking about this season? Basically, a couple of their, their best, best player players. was hurt this yeah. year. Yeah, that's right. And not only was it their best player, it was a guy who was like Naismith. Like you know, like he had he been healthy, he would have been a Naismith yeah. finalist. Lance McCuller Jr. That's right. So, I mean, it happens. I no excuse for the Notre Dame women's though. Am I right? For what the injuries? <laughs> what are you talking about? What they continued on. Oh, that's true. That's true. They found a way. All right, Jess, fill in the blank. John Calipari leaving Kentucky after 15 years in Lexington to take over at Arkansas is blank. It's shocking, honestly. I never thought Calipari would leave Kentucky for another SEC school. Um, and it's shocking. Again, like I always throw the term out like lateral, right? And I don't know what the next move is in terms – like can he go any higher? It felt like Kentucky for what he – like what he wants to do, it felt like Kentucky was always going to be home for him, right? And like when you talk about getting some of the best players, them going on to the NBA, helping them in their career, you know, preparing them for the NBA, et cetera, it felt like Kentucky was always going to be the best place to do that. And so to go to another SEC school – is really shocking. And it, it, like, I remember going back to like 2014 LeBron, when LeBron was going to come back to Cleveland for the second time and the Cavs had the number one overall draft pick, they threw a ton of money at John Calipari to become, to, to ask them to become their next head coach. 
Yep. He turned it down. And so clearly he wants to stay in college. And so how much of a pay upgrade is he getting? I don't know. But did you see the video of him today walking his dog in the I stroller? Did. Pushing the you know stroller. What that, yeah. You know what that gave – what vibes that gave to me? I think you'll appreciate this. That gave me um, George Bluth vibes off Arrested <laughs> Development. I love it. Doesn't it though? Like he's like like walking around knowing he's kind of a wanted man being like, oh. Uh-huh. You're coming up to me asking oh, me, oh, me? You're talking to me as I'm walking my dog in a stroller on like a very public, you know, road. Like it felt very, right. I don't know. I just, as soon as it, I saw that, I was like, this feels like George Bluth off the rest of <laughs> <laughs> when he's like in hiding or whatever. Yeah. Um, but it's it ultimately to answer your question, it's shocking. And yeah, I was shocked too, but there's a different level of expectation, obviously. Now, you know, 15 years at Kentucky is a long time and he had a lot of success but you know there was already talk when he when they lost to Oakland you know that wow this this could be it for Calipari I didn't really think it would come to that but money talks I guess because between Jerry Jones and I was going to say do you, you hear know, Jerry Walmart Jones family is funding, and the Tyson funding chicken this? family yeah they're like they're throwing all kinds of money together for him down there and it sounds like Calipari is going to kind of shift his philosophy as well because he had stuck you know, pretty hard to that to the one and done guns, and I think that that's why he didn't have more consistent success here down the stretch. Like he's gonna he's gonna go to the portal more, and you know those those kind of things. And so you're so telling I, me it's gonna be more of team basketball, theoretically. Because yeah. honestly, and I don't think this is a bad thing. John Calipari prided himself off of helping those one and done guys. Be it's first the round NBA. Like he, yeah. that was part of the gig to him. Like right. he he compensated not winning national champ. I mean, at least he says so, right? Like everyone's not gonna be like, oh, you know, I don't care about winning national champion, but like part of the process to him or what made the job gratifying or fulfilling to him is knowing that he would get some of the top talent in the world and maturing these men as much as possible to go on to the NBA and be as successful as possible. Like that was a part of his role, and so. For him to step away from that and be more team basketball, and like you said, maybe two to four year guys and transfer portal guys, I think we might see like Memphis John Calipari come back. You know, when he had Derrick Rose there, it's exciting. I think it's exciting for college basketball. Yeah, I mean Arkansas is going to be a player again, like they were. I, I know you're way too young to remember Nolan Richardson and Forty Minutes of Hell and all that kind of stuff but those were fun days i mean it felt like arkansas was good at football and basketball like right before i was around like the 80s and 90s <laughs> that's, that's true just like the cowboys were right good at something before you were around <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right but you know again different era different era you know back then the last time arkansas was was really good when guys stuck around for four years cordless williamson and scotty thurman and and those kind of guys but uh It'll be it'll be uh it'll be fun to kind of see what what Calipari can bring to that. It's an evolution. How much is he how much is he willing or going to change at the end of the day? Yeah, back in the day, that's right. UNLV was was relevant. UCLA was a power. Duke, all those different programs. Tommy uh, <laughs> Tommy says we haven't seen Jesse's props. Prop bets. I've been doing good with baseball so far. I'm waiting for the season to kind of progress a little bit. I, you know, like it's hard with baseball when you have 162 games. You can't really figure out trends in the first week. True. But it's fine. Right. We'll be looking forward to that then. All right, Jess. Appreciate you coming in today. Get some sleep tonight. Sleep it off. Yeah. One more thing. Nope. That's it. I was just telling myself I'm number one because I oh, showed okay. up today and Vince didn't. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> you're number one. You're the uh, you're the favorite co-host today. Vince, Thank you. Vince falls to number four, I think, by the time the week is over, right? All right, well, that's going to do it. Hit that like button before you leave. And, of course, subscribe, rate, review, listen to your podcasts as well. We appreciate you, and we will – Talk to you. Uh oh, Tommy's calling you out for no showing on Friday. I didn't no show. I let the people know I had obligations. Vince is scheduled. That this Vince is, an, is anticipated to be here on Friday. He is expected to be here on Friday. Vince put together this spreadsheet that everyone plugs in days on and off and all that kind of stuff. And I think Vince is taking advantage of the spreadsheet. <laughs> 
We'll talk to you tomorrow on Ivy Nation Sports Talk.